got for you this week. It hasn't been an easy year for the SNP, if you will forgive the colossal understatement. The party's conference gets underway in Aberdeen this morning against a backdrop of a by-election battering, an MP leaving them for the Tories, and division and confusion over perhaps the party's most important policy, the route to independence. An unenviable pile of problems then. So what to do and where to start? I'll be asking one of the party's rising stars, the Transport and Infrastructure Secretary, Mary McCallan. The news this week, of course, dominated by events in the Middle East as Israel prepares. And of course, you can let us know what you think about what you're hearing this morning. We really do want you to join in the conversation. We always do. And you can do that, of course, by using the hashtag BBC Sunday show on social media. So to Aberdeen, where delegates at the SNP conference have a lot to discuss this morning. What happened in Rutherglen? When did the nationalist MP Lisa Cameron become a unionist? And what's the best route to the independent future they all crave so badly? If you were with us last week on The Sunday Show, you'll have heard Stephen Noon, one of the key SNP strategists in years past, suggest the era of the referendum is over and the party needs a whole new approach, maybe even put independence on hold for a while and focus on getting more powers in the short term. But is that going to be enough for the less patient members of the party? Well, let's go to the conference now and speak to Mary McCallan, the Transport Secretary. Good morning to you. Good morning, Martin. Thanks very much for being with us this morning. You went into your conference this time last year with a 16-point lead over Labour in the polls. Um, the most recent polling suggests that's all gone in a year. How, how much trouble is your party in at the moment? I don't believe that our party is in trouble. Of course, polls are just that. They are opinion polls. I'm not, I'm not pretending we don't watch them. We do very carefully watch them. But I'm coming into this conference as a proud SNP member, a proud member of the SNP government that's been delivering for the people of Scotland determinedly for the last 16 years, 16 years which have not been without turmoil in the UK. It's been a, a very difficult time. And during that period, as I say, the SNP has done everything in its power with the powers we have to protect the people of Scotland from those contextual factors. And in everything that we do, we have tried to further the social and the economic well-being of the people of this country. That is our raison d'etre. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you're suffering what a lot of governments around the world are suffering at the moment, in an economic downturn. People blame the people in power for the fact that their lives aren't going as well as they'd want to. But the fact is, uh, there's a large section of the population now who don't think you are governing very well. What do you do at conference in the next couple of days to try and turn that round? Well, Martin, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. I've been reflecting of late. I'm 30 years old. And for the last 15 years, the people of the UK have been through a financial crash. They have been through 13 years of UK austerity. That led into a pandemic um, and into the hardest of hard Brexit cliff edges pursued by the UK government in the midst of that pandemic. And we have come out of that into a cost of living crisis, which has been exacerbated by the economic incompetence of the UK government. So it is no wonder in those circumstances that whilst my party have done everything we can with devolved powers to protect people, and I will happily get into the ways in which we have delivered that, but it's no wonder in those circumstances that people are seeking change. And the message from my party in our conference is that you don't need to trust one or other uh, indistinguishable London leader for change. Scotland should trust itself to deliver change, take but, the powers into our own hands. Only real change can be delivered with independence. But that's the centre of all of this, isn't it? I mean, what you've had to do, what you, what you needed to do was link independence to everything else and convince people that all the things that are above independence on their list of immediate priorities are tied to independence. And certainly the lesson of Rutherglen suggests that you've just failed to do that. Rutherglen is a unique example, um, and I think that you know the, the, the seat itself has swung between the SNP and Labour with, in every election since 2015. London Labour headquarters threw the kitchen sink at it, busing activists up to uh, Rutherglen as our grassroots were doing the work in the wind and rain uh, ourselves. Yeah, look, two-thirds of your supporters who voted for we... you there in 2019 didn't turn out this time. That's a big problem. No, I was just about to reflect that, that, please don't get me wrong, we 
are, uh, we never take a single bit of support for granted and we will do a great deal of soul searching on um, the, the, the outcome of the Rutherglen and Hamilton by-election. But the point remains that I have no doubt that after the 16, 17 years that people have lived through in the UK, that people are seeking change, but change will not be delivered by Rishi Sunak or indeed by Brexit loving, flip flopping Keir Starmer. Real change only comes when the people of Scotland trust themselves to take their future into their own hands and that's what the SNP offer. Okay, I, I want to get to that and your offer in a minute because you don't quite know what your offer is as yet or certainly how you get there. I do. Well, well let, let's come to that in a second. I do want to go through, the Sunday papers all seem to have done different polling and, and you know polls are polls, right? And it's a thousand people, two thousand people, whatever, but I'm sure you monitor them very, very closely. Most of these polls suggest that they don't like many of your policy offerings at the moment, particularly progressive tax. The Sunday Times has got a poll saying almost three quarters of Scots uh, think we should pay only the same tax as the English or less. I'm very proud of the Scottish Government's approach to progressive taxation because what it says is that those who can afford to pay a little more should pay a little more. But the important thing is that what people see in Scotland in response for uh, that taxation policy is a social contract and universal services which are of high quality. We do watch polls, Martin, uh, and we will continue to do so. And I appreciate it's anecdotal, but when I got in a taxi from the train station in Aberdeen yesterday to come to the conference, my taxi driver said to me, quite unprompted, I should be very glad to pay a little bit more tax for a stronger uh, society and a stronger community. Well, and well that's one voter that you've won, right? That, that's... Unprompted, and it's anecdotal. I understand that. But it does reflect a sentiment in Scotland which says we are willing to pay a little bit more, well, not a huge because, amount more, but a little bit more, Times, for better quality services we can rely on. According to this poll in the Sorry, Sunday I, Times, I, I it, it. it doesn't say that. It's two, three quarters of the population don't believe that. Well, look, that's absolutely fine. I'm not, I'm not denying what, what polls may have found. As I say, we will, we will study polls and we will listen, more importantly, to our constituents and to the people of Scotland who are speaking to us. But let's think about what that delivers in Scotland. I talked earlier about being very proud of my government's record of delivery. That has been free university tuition, two million people in Scotland travelling on buses for free. It's free prescriptions. It's 1140 hours of funded childcare. It's the Scottish child payment, £25 in the pocket of every eligible child yep. every week. People, keeping people from destitution in this country. That is a social contract, sure. which I am proud that my party has fostered over the 16 years that we have been but, but in there, government. But there is, what we're saying to the people... There is evidence that your support is, is bleeding away. I mean, if we look at support for independence being about 50-50 and support for you being about late 30s, there, there, there is a, a, a turn away from you, even by people who believe in ultimately what you want to do and where you want to go. Let me ask you about other policies, though, in the recent past. Gender recognition reform, um, highly protected marine areas, the, the um, bottle deposit scheme. These were areas where you seem to have been on a different side to the majority of the public, the kind of late Sturgeon era policies, uh, many of them associated actually with, with your partners in government, with the Greens. Did you just misjudge public mood on a lot of these things? Well, let me take the, the one example that you cited there, which I oversaw in government, the highly protected marine areas. The premise of that is that we're in a nature and climate emergency. Nobody can deny that. And we have to be willing to take measures which are commensurate with the scale of that challenge. What we put to the public was a proposal for protecting 10% of Scotland's seas. And I was very clear that I understood that this was a, 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 a proposal that would elicit a lot of opinion. That's why I went early and fulsomely to the people of Scotland and why I listened to the response which says that this is not the right approach and that's why I'm not taking it forward anymore. That's a responsive government which is seeking to lead in some of the greatest challenges that we face today but is responding to what the people of Scotland tell us to do. And in something like the climate emergency which um, I'm responsible for in government, it seriously challenges us to move at a pace and scale which reflects it. But I am committed to in, in doing that, to doing so hand in hand with the okay. people of Scotland and always testing how they feel about it. All right, listen, let, let, let's look at the, the, the big issue on the 
agenda, certainly today, you're, the, the means by which you could get to independence. You're going to decide whether you need most of the seats in Scotland at a general election or the majority of the seats. The First Minister, though, admitted this week that uh, people don't understand why independence is relevant to their everyday lives. Is that not just a striking rejection of everything you've been telling them for the past 16 years? No, I, I don't think it is. I think what the First Minister is reflecting is that the SNP understand the pressures that are bearing down on the people of Scotland just now, whether it's their energy bills, their mortgage payments uh, and everything else that they're facing, uh, in, which has been uh, brought from uh, the cost of living crisis, and that we are determined to demonstrate not only what we will do with the powers we have to protect people from that cost of living crisis. You know, for example, we tripled the fuel and security fund. We instituted an evictions ban. Yeah, well, we let's have how you get to independence, uh, scrapped though. peak rail fares. Yeah, absolutely. So whilst we will use every power at our disposal to protect people from the cost of living, the ultimate way that you address it is you address it at source. And that is by removing Scotland from the broken Westminster system and trusting ourselves to take our future into our own hands. OK, can you really lose, say, 15 seats at the next election, get maybe, what, 35% of the vote, and then go to Westminster and credibly say to them, right, we're ready to start talking, sit down with us and discuss how we get out of the UK? That seems ridiculous, doesn't it? Well, look, I think... The, the... No, I, I, I don't think it does. I think what, if my party agrees today that we go into the Westminster election calling that a majority of seats will be the trigger for us to begin independence negotiations with the UK. That's what our party will have decided. And then we take it to the people of Scotland and they will cast their verdict as they have uh, and elected the SNP so uh, continuously in recent years. But we will work for people's support of it. But it, let me put it to you this way, Martin. My party has a mandate to deliver independence for Scotland. If it seems that we are in a perverse situation, it's because the UK government and UK parties that are trying to get into number 10 consistently are willing to deny the people of Scotland their route to, yeah, um, to have their democratic exactly. will. Exactly. So who do you negotiate the question, with? I noticed on How the are BBC, these negotiations going to work? Well, we've set Who's that in out the in the motion, as you'll see. It proposes that... Well, we would expect a UK government that respects democracy uh, to be in the room, unless we are saying that the UK, which was once... Uh, held up to be a voluntary union of nations is now one in which Scotland is held against its will. I noticed in the BBC commentary that you noted that UK governments are refusing to recognise the democratic will and, and quote that the SNP has run out of road as a result. What I would expect to at least be put to the UK government is why do you think that is an acceptable position to be in? We certainly don't. And the SNP will make it our mission to continue to ensure that the people of Scotland's democratic will is heard in the UK. OK, let, let me look in, in the time we've got left at, uh, at Lisa Cameron's defection to the Tories. That was a, a disastrous look for, for your party last week. She said she was bullied and persecuted by your colleagues at Westminster to such an extent that it had a seriously negative impact on her mental health. Do you believe her? Just for a bit of context, with everything else that's going on this week, not least the humanitarian crisis unfolding between Palestine and Israel, the uh, actions of Lisa Cameron are really very, very low. Do you believe on, her? On my, and I'm sure the First Minister's uh, priority list. I think it's, I, I know Lisa Cameron personally, our constituencies overlap to some degree, and personally, I wish her no ill will, but I find it hard to believe anything that somebody says when one minute they are on video saying that the Tories have dragged Scotland out of the EU and we need independence, and in the next breath, they're joining the Conservative so, and Unionist So you're party. saying she's not telling the truth about the way her mental health was impacted by the treatment of your colleagues at Westminster? I, I personally don't know any of the details of that. I understand that our Westminster leader and deputy leader reached out to Lisa and, and sought to support her in that. And I don't think that um, she was able to uh, articulate the, the nub of the problem when they had that conversation. I'm not saying I don't believe Lisa, I'm saying that I haven't given it a great deal of thought, given everything else that's going on. But equally, I do find it a little difficult uh, to swallow that, uh, what, what somebody says when they are so willing to have two very different public positions in such a short period of time. See, 
It's not just Lisa Cameron, is it? Joe Cherry said she was badly treated by colleagues at Westminster and the party didn't give her support. She, was, she had a, a series of problems that, that, and received little or no support from the party. Angus Brenda McNeil has now left the party. He had a big fight with the, with the whip. Well, I mean, what, what is going on at Westminster and to what extent have these claims been investigated properly? Well, you're speaking in very general terms about um, situations that some of my Westminster colleagues have been in. I, well, I don't I'll, I'll, know, let me ask frankly, you very specifically the then. What, what, what was done with Lisa Cameron? Other than, has... other, than, other than Stephen Flynn and Mary Black taking her for a coffee or whatever and sitting down and saying what's going on, what is actually is this not is it not time now to get an independent team of, of uh, experts in to give a proper audit on the behaviour of your colleagues at Westminster? Because there's several people who say it's a toxic atmosphere down there. You can't just say, well, we've had a chat with them and it's, everything seems to be all right, can you? No, that, that's not what I'm saying. I don't believe there is a toxic atmosphere whatsoever, although I should say I am a Holyrood MSP. I spend all of my time in Scotland uh, working for my constituents here. What I do think is absolutely essential is that if anybody has any concerns whatsoever uh, with their treatment, that they're able to raise it and have that heard. And I understand in the case of Lisa Cameron, albeit that I am not personally involved with it, I understand that those mechanisms were put in place and that there was uh, that no specific issues were raised okay. by Lisa at the time. Let me let me ask you finally, uh, Mary McCallan. Uh, the, the First Minister spoke very movingly to Victoria Derbyshire this morning about the plight of his parents-in-law in Gaza. Uh, are you comfortable? What do you make of the the UK government's position? on the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict? Well, I should say that personally I have found it really difficult to articulate just how upsetting I have found the last week. Um, I have played over and over in my mind the account of the, the terror that rained down upon the people of Israel and I, I frankly can't get it out of my mind. Um, and we have been clear, as I think the UK government have, that Israel has a right to protect itself and to defend itself against terror. But equally what is clear is that that is not a justification for the destruction of, of, of civilian lives in Palestine. So like the First Minister, uh, I will call for compassion, I will call for peace, for humanitarian corridors to be set up as a matter of urgency to allow those who can to leave and to allow aid to get in yeah. to those who, who cannot leave and who are trapped. Okay, Mary McCallan, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank you.